the alumni of the internment camps who were released in Canada in 1941, two and three, were the only refugees from Nazi Germany that came to Canada between 1939 and 1945. And as we know, very few refugees were admitted to Canada in the 30s, so this was a rather sizable group who came, about 2,000. And they came at just the right moment. Because at the end of the war and in the immediate post-war years, Canada was sprouting. Everything was beginning. Uh, there was a mood of optimism and self-confidence uh, of which we were the beneficiaries. And were able in various degrees in circumstances uh, to make contributions of a sort. And I want to talk about three friends of mine, all musicians, who were in a sense characteristic and who made outstanding uh, uh, contributions. And they are Helmut Blume and John Newmark and Franz Kramer. They're all musicians of high quality. Uh, Blume was a concert pianist. He came from Berlin. He was about two or three years older than I was, and he was a very imposing, tall, very German-looking, blue-eyed, uh, romantic artist. Women loved him. Uh, and he was a very good writer and he did the broadcast with me until 1946 and then he left the CBC and went to McGill and started teaching the piano and later on became a very efficient and talented administrator, academic administrator who built up the faculty of music uh, which had been very undistinguished before he came to a first-class teaching organism uh, with very good people and an orchestra and up-to-date facilities. And he then negotiated the acquisition of a concert hall, Pollock Hall. And uh, all this he did with great affection for his students and conscientiousness and devotion to McGill, which he had until he died about eight years ago. I should mention that Blume had a particularly interesting escape from Germany. His father had been a psychiatrist, and in his youth, Helmut Blume had the opportunity to study the behavior of schizophrenics. The father, they lived in an integral and he, the father, was at head of a, an institution. So when Blume was ca uh, called up to serve in the German army in 1938, uh, it was in, 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 uh, horrible for him. Hated every second of it. Couldn't wait to get out. But the only way to, he could to dream of to get out was to impersonate a schizophrenic which he did with such conviction that he was, uh, he, he, he kind of fooled the, the medical officers and he got out of the army and the moment he got, he, he was demobbed, of, this was before the war. The next day he went to England and he, then he taught the piano at Canterbury and later in England and in London and then he was interned. Now, John Newmark, very different character. He also came from Berlin. He originally was born in Bremen 
and he had a very musical background. Uh, he was the most extraordinary talented accompanist. He could sight read anything. He couldn't remember even the national anthem. He couldn't remember a thing. But he could read the most difficult and intricate and contemporary music. And he had the great gift of being, uh, of accompanying. And it was thanks to him very much in the very early years that Maureen Forrester became such an extraordinary artist and interpreter of German leader, of German songs, because he he taught her. He did, First of all, he did, in a sense, he was my, one of those who discovered her. Incredible talent and marvellous voice and intuitive understanding of music and a sounding of the language without really being able to to, to know it. So she, he, and, and he taught her the meaning of the songs and the words and the elocution and the pronunciation and all this, which she imbibed with an amazing facility. And it was marvelous to watch. I was very much involved in all this because he and I shared an apartment on Crescent Street and he was very social and he invited a lot of people. He had a kind of salon, French, English. His French was very, very good. And a lot of people in the, who were beginning to play a role in the musical life of Montreal came to him and were his friends. And so he became a great influence among, in that generation of post-war musicians and audiences. Who uh, He was very elegant, he had no stage fright ever. He performed many recitals, and uh, he gave he gave the people whom he accompanied the kind of self confidence self confidence they needed. Uh, the third musician I would like to mention, who was also very useful in the development of music after the war was Franz Kramer who then who first joined us at the CBC and then he went to television and became a music producer of extraordinary pr proficiency if that is the right word he he produced 17 operas in about 6 years operas nowadays if you want to do a television an opera on television it's like D-Day, you have to have a international coalitions. <laughs> at, 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 but that time, under very difficult circumstances, one man, to his understanding of the music and the opera and his ability to recruit, mobilize the necessary resources, he was an incredible diplomat. Uh, uh, he then became, I remember, Glenn Gould when he... Uh, when when that talent arrived early, in many ways it was in the fifties, uh, they became very good friends, and uh, Franz was I think was also able because he had studied with Alban Berg in Vienna, he was also be able to be useful to Glenn because he had wide cult musical erudition and culture. In fact, Franz knew everything. It was hard ever to catch him out. Impossible. He always knew everything. Now I'd like to make a point about all these people. Um, there we were, there they were, just arriving at the perfect psychological moment in the history of, let's say, music in Canada. Um, and this was before, before there was a problem of multiculturalism, immigration, assimilation, all these things, which became... Which with problems with which we are now living, but this didn't arise. Didn't arise. There we were, refugees. <laughs> we were naturalized immediately after the war. Uh, we we became enthusiastic Canadians overnight, and we were able to identify ourselves. I shouldn't include myself because I was not in the same league as those three people. Uh, with a with a new emerging Canadian consciousness and pride, 
There was, for example, one of us, Charles Wasserman, who long before Quebec nationalism and cultural nationalism reared its leg, re- uh, it, it discovered the beauty and of Quebec folk songs and researched them and found them and had them performed on the CBC. And that was, he, he was ahead of his time. And so these three people were ahead of their time in the history of of Canadian music, of contemporary modern music. In fact, it is they who took great pride in finding Canadian talent and in, in having Canadian music performed. John Newmark got uh, read for manuscripts, compositions of of people whom he knew and who had not really been recognized yet. And he managed to push them and, and promote them. And Blume, in teaching young people in at McGill, was constantly aware of the need to nourish Canadian performers. And uh, uh, it is, in fact, amazing that the, we were not just, we, they, were n- not just allowed to become Canadians, but that we were, in fact in many ways, ahead of our time as cultural nationalists of a sort uh, and played a very important role in the the post-war blossoming of Canada.